Okay, so yeah, thanks for joining everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the conceptual model for immersive experience in extended reality. Um, so basically, I wrote this um, paper over the summer uh, this year during the lockdown period, because you know the best thing to do during the lockdown was to read. Uh, papers I wanted to read for but didn't find time but yeah it's a perfect chance to go through all the papers and uh, yeah and then I wanted to do some more literature review on the topic of uh, immersion presence and involvement and all this uh, stuff so <clears throat> yeah I wrote this paper in the end a conceptual model of immersive experience in extended reality and I uh, posted it on uh, Sci Archive is uh, one of the repository, uh, I mean, what, like open access repositories for preprints. So now, yeah, it's um, in the preprint uh, status, and I'm planning to submit it to a journal uh, soon. So it's, I'm still improving this manuscript anyway. So if you have any comments or feedbacks, please do let me know. And um, yeah, so. You can download it from this link, and if you're interested in this topic after this talk, you can see more details in the paper. So, um, motivation for this. Um, immersive, this word is used a lot in, in um, not audio, not just audio, but everywhere in the industry. Multimedia industry uses this term a lot. and. Uh, and and many times it's used for marketing purposes. And when you actually yeah, look at the technology, it's, uh, well, sometimes you can maybe see that uh, it doesn't have any surrounding speakers, it doesn't have any HMD, but how come it's immersive? You know, because there is this um, sort of uh, conception that people think, oh, immersive means 3D audio, immersive means VR headset, you know? But this word, it can be used um, in other uh, cases as well and it is actually um, not a word that is specific to uh, 3D and, and VR, AR stuff. So uh, I want to, in this talk, I want to go through the different definitions of immersion and the multidimensionality uh, of immersion and all other related terms like presence and involvement and uh, how they are related to each other and things like that. So, the main question here um, I, I had from many years ago is how to measure immersion? How, how do we evaluate immers immersiveness or immersion? But firstly, uh, what does it mean by immersion exactly? Because peop different people um, uh, have different definitions about immersion and there is some sort of bias uh, uh, towards either experience or technology or maybe um, some people use uh, this term to mean more perceptual stuff some people are biased more towards cognitive stuff so for example when we have lots of speakers I mean this is kind of famous picture you can get from internet when you search 3d audio <laughs> I think it's from Sony 360 reality audio maybe um, I don't know, but anyway, this a lot of speakers surrounding you. Okay, so if you use more speakers, does it mean more immersive? Well, I mean, we are all audio engineers, so we, we know the answer. <laughs> it can be, but it's not necessarily more immersive. For example, if you play a, a, a mono pink noise from all 25 speakers, you know, it's going to be horrible. It's not going to be immersive at all. It's just, you know, very phasey, unpleasant experience, right? So the number of speakers doesn't automatically mean more immersive. Um, but you can be immersed without any technology. You can be immersed in a daydream. Okay, or you can read a novel and then you can be so immersed in 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 that uh, the narrative of the story so yeah what does immersion mean here then i mean people tend to use this uh, term immersion um, especially um, people who are studying presence uh, they like to use the term immersion as more technological process whereas 
uh, there are some people who also think immersion is totally cognitive stuff, it's nothing to do with um, technology. So, there's this problem here. What is the definition of immersion? How do we define it? And in fact, I found it is a really difficult concept to define it in a simple sentence. And I think that's where most, most of the problems come from because people like to use a simple sentence to define everything, but whenever you try to do it, it may uh, bias towards just one facet of, of this concept. So, this also causes some unnecessary confusion. You know, with all these terms and concepts, sometimes different terms um, have a similar meaning, or the same term is used for meaning different things. So this can be a problem, especially in research, in terms of consistency, right? Because when you read a paper and this guy talks about immersion as a technology, but another paper talks about immersion, you know, as, a, as an experience. And some people think it's a totally cognitive stuff, and some people think it's both. And, you know, some people regard presence as the same thing as immersion, but some other people totally disagree with it and they separate these two concepts strictly. So, um, and another problem is um, most of the research in presence and immersion um, have been done in the context of digital games. And so it's not clear whether we can use the same concepts and terms in other applications in XR. So um, my aim was to uh, in this paper, basically, uh, to explicate and synthesize various existing concepts from the literature and and establish some hierarchical relationship between all these terms. So my aim was not to develop a new concept, but um, because all the existing concepts, they have valid points, they are all important. I think important thing is to uh, establish um, some sort of framework to uh, use all these concepts. So hierarchical uh, relationship, which is more higher level concept, which is a lower level concept. And what's the, for example, independent variable, or what's the dependent variable? So from experimental design point of view, uh, having a clear uh, hierarchical relationship of all these concepts is quite important. So, um, and also I wanted to propose a common terminology to avoid some, some confusion. And eventually, the aim is to provide a global conceptual model of immersive experience that can be applied in, in various uh, applications in XR. Uh, so, it's a higher level, simple model we can start from. Of course, there are lots of low level things that we need to consider especially if you just focus on audio, 3D audio, uh, immersive audio, there are lots of low-level features. But uh, um, this sc scope of this paper is not on that. So, um, the first model, the initial model um, we came up with is this uh, active and passive uh, paradigm. Of immersive experience, so it was yeah. Callum Eaton, my previous uh, former uh, master student, and I, I wrote this paper for the York AES uh, Interactive and Immersive Conference in two thousand and nineteen, and we basically proposed that we can divide immersion into passive experience and active experience. And at that time, we uh, thought that yeah, okay, passive experience is about presence, so sense of being there. And active immersion is more about cognitive absorption or involvement. So when you're listening to a classical music in 3D, then it's more about passive experience. And, you know, it just pro provides you with the sense of being in the console hall. But when you're playing um, like a VR game, then basically you need to use your skills and you have to be actively engaged uh, in, in the scene and you have to actually play something. So that involves your cognitive effort, so that's more of an active immersion. And then the immersive system needs to support these two. So uh, the system is the depend uh, independent variable and the, the, the perceptual and cognitive attributes are dependent variables. But at that time, uh, I, I didn't realize it actually 
presence can be also a cognitive thing. So I realized that this cannot be separated like a night and day or black and white. You know, it's not as simple as that. And through more literature review during the summer, I um, got to think about uh, the, the relationship between all these high level concepts. And uh, later I'll be talking about it more, but a presence can be also a cognitive thing and involvement or cognitive absorption <clears throat> can also be influenced by perceptual or sensory simulation. So they all interplay together, you know, for, for immersive experience. That's how I came up with this, this model here. And this is what I'm going to go through today and explain how I came to develop this. Right, so let's start with definition of immersion. Uh, dictionary definitions is always a good place to start. Right, so the Oxford Learner's Dictionary says, Immersion is the act of putting somebody or something into a liquid, especially so that uh, they or it are completely covered, the state of being covered by a liquid. Okay, but there is a second definition in the same dictionary, the state of being completely involved in something, right? So we can see that uh, the first definition is more about physical act of um, putting somebody into a liquid. So it's an analogy with maybe, yeah, you, you, Im you put somebody into a virtual environment and surround the person with all these different objects and, you know, like putting somebody into a virtual acoustics and you hear a lot of reverb and reflections from everywhere. Okay, and that's a perceptual or sensory <coughs> um, experience. But completely involved, being involved is a cognitive thing, right? So that takes your cognitive effort. You need to think and decide and, you know, depending on various uh, contextual factors, the, the experience can vary. So, so the dictionary suggests that immersion can be both sensory and cognitive. And this multidimensionality of immersion has been um, studied by many researchers uh, from decades ago. So um, yeah, the typology of immersion from the literature, uh, I'm just gonna show you some examples here. So Lombard and Deaton, they um, describe immersion as perceptual immersion and psychological immersion. And Ryan also uses these terms, narrative immersion and ludic immersion. And Arsenal, um, yeah, splits immersion into sensory, fictional, and systemic immersion. And Ermi and Meyer, uh, they have this so-called SCI model, which is sensory immersion, challenge-based immersion, and imaginative immersion. And Adamson Rowling uses these terms, narrative and strategic, um, strategic and tactical immersion. But um, I went through all these definitions, and I'm not going to show them all here, but um, they can be actually grouped depending on whether they are passive or uh, active. So perceptual and sensory immersion, they both mean um, a kind of sense of being there. So perceptual immersion is defined as the degree to which a virtual environment submerges the perceptual system of the user by Bioka and Delaney. And uh, sensory immersion is basically the sensation of being surrounded by a virtual environment. This is kind of common definition you found you find um, in the literature. For example, McMahon and Ermi and Myra. So they all involve some sort of sensory simulation using technology. And this is effectively um, a presence, sense of being there uh, in a virtual environment, but with or without virtual beings. So this, we can split presence into physical presence and uh, social self-presence. I'll be talking about it later. So effectively, yeah, these immersion terms um, related to presence. But we also have some uh, active uh, immersion terms like imaginative immersion, narrative immersions. But they both mean, um, they connote this concept of involvement, in, but in the narrative of content. So when you, re when you read a novel and you're so immersed into the story and, and you feel like you're there, like, you know, in the story world. And, 
and you forget about the real life and just be totally uh, involved that's like im imaginative im uh, immersion narrative immersion on the other hand we have these terms ludic challenge based system systemic and strategic tactical immersion they all about involvement in a task or activity so especially when you're playing games this this kind of immersion is important but they all commonly connote this concept of involvement right so you see where i'm kind of going into now um we can sort of simplify these this concept you know i mean instead of using all different terms we can actually use simply the terms presence and involvement and then define all the underlying uh, low level concepts to support these high level concepts um so i mentioned about uh, potential risk of using standard def standalone definition because we talked about the multidimensionality multidimensionality of immersion but now some people attempted to define immersion in a single sentence like uh, a psychological state characterized by perceiving oneself to be enveloped by included in and interacting with an environment that provides a continuous stream of stimuli and experiences by Whitmer and Singer. This um, definition um, is more about perceptual experience and it involves technology, which is all fine. But uh, in this definition, I found yeah, the cognitive aspect of immersion is not clearly implied. Um, on the other hand, Agrawal et al. Uh, in a recent AES journal paper, they define uh, immersion as a very much cognitive uh, experience rather than a perceptual experience that involves technology. So a phenomenon experienced by an individual when they are in a state of deep mental involvement in which their cognitive processes, with or without sensory simulation, cause a shift in their attentional state such that one may experience dissociation from the awareness of the physical world. I mean, this is all valid uh, comment, but uh, the potential uh, issue I have here is because it's more about cognitive and it kind of uh, separates the concept of presence from the definition of immersion. And this uh, dissociation from the awareness of physical world is uh, it's actually um, about narrative-induced transportation, they mention it in their paper, rather than technology-induced one. So this definition can maybe applied wider in a wider uh, applications, like uh, even reading a novel, you know, you can also um, say that's an immersion, immersive experience. But in terms of XR, you know, where we always have some technological aspect and sensory simulation is, is necessary in XR applications. We don't necessarily have to um, just just focus on the cognitive stuff because the perceptual stuff can also be a really important factor for immersion. And Slater, he's a very famous academic uh, in the world of presence research and, uh, and a lot of uh, other researchers who follow his notion consider that uh, immersion is a technology basically immersion and technology they are synonyms in their uh, context so uh, immersion is defined as what the technology delivers to provide the user with the sensation of being there so it's immersion is basically considered as a determinant of presence so immersion is like an independent variable to to presence which is the dependent variable so you can say that the, the more advanced the technology is the more immersive. That's basically what presence research uh, researchers tend to say in their paper all the time. Okay, so the assumption is the more advanced technology is, the more immersive. But is it really true? Or is it always the case? I mean, we can discuss about it um, uh, later. But um, yeah, so a better immersion boosts the level of presence. So this is a kind of common like sentence you would see in in this uh, presence research literature. So you you can already see that this term immersion is is used as um, 
uh, as a determinant of presence rather than the end result, right? So my proposal here is to avoid all this potential confusion, uh, I'd like to use the, t uh, the term explicitly, immersive experience when we talk about experience and immersive system when we talk about technology. Right, rather than just saying immersion, because if you just say immersion, it's not clear whether you're meaning technological process or actual experience. So in this case, immersive system is independent variable, and the immersive experience is the dependent variable. So now we have a clear hierarchical uh, structure. So I'm gonna give you an example, a, a sentence here. So when we say a higher level of immersion leads to a stronger sense of presence. So then, what does it immersion mean here? It can be quite vague, actually. Uh, this is actually a practical example I got in. Uh, I had a problem with when I was reading a lot of papers. Some people say this kind of sentence: a higher level of immersion causes a higher level of presence. Then I was thinking, okay, so immersion is an experience to me. So. Is presence a bigger, higher level concept than immersion? Immersive experience to me was the opposite, and so I got like confused. And so, what do they actually mean here? And 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 I realized they were following Slater's notion of immersion, and they cited Slater's definition of immersion, and they follow it. So, I suggest that okay, if this means system, then we can say a more advanced immersive system produces a stronger sense of presence. That's more clear, right? But if that was uh, meant to, uh, you know, mean an experience, then we can say a higher level of immersive experience leads to a stronger sense of presence. But to me, that doesn't sound quite right because I think immersive experience is is a is a is a wider and bigger concept to presence. So I'll actually shift it around. A stronger sense of presence leads to a higher level of immersive experience. So now we're going into this discussion of which is a higher level, which is a lower level. You know, this hierarchical structure I mentioned about. Um, so here we go. I put immersive experience as the ultimate um, end goal, basically. You know, we want to create an immersive experience. And for that, we have the three main higher level attributes, which are physical presence, social self-presence, and involvement. And they work together to produce the immersive experience. And my assumption is that this immersive experience is measurable, is quantifiable. Uh, through um, measuring the level of each individual components. I'll, I'll cover that a bit more later. So presence and involvement interplay for immersive experience. This is contradictory to Slater's um, suggestion because he completely separates presence and involvement. They are almost orthogonal concepts um, to Slater, but I I found that from reading other papers, um, presence can definitely influence involvement, and involvement can also boost presence. So they interplay. Uh, so in this way, so now we saw so this uh, grouping: perceptual and sensory immersion. They're related to presence, and the other uh, active immersion concepts. They're effectively about involvement, and they interact with each other and complement each other. So this is basic um, notion I propose. So let's go in a little bit deeper on this topic of presence. And there's no way to cover all existing concepts in presence in this talk, but I'm just going to go through some important, uh, most uh, widely cited concepts. So the terms Presence and immersion often used as synonyms by some researchers, but some others completely distinguish them as separate concepts. Um, the presence is also multidimensional, like immersion, and the typology of uh, by by um, Bioka. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but yeah, Bioka's typology of presence is arguably the the most cited um, typology of presence. 
in the literature, and he suggests these three terms, physical, social, and self. And later, I'm, I'm grouping social and self in my model, and I'll tell you why. So let's talk about physical presence a bit. So um, the sense of being in a virtual environment is basically what we call physical presence. So sense of being there, simply put. And this is a consequence of sensory simulation, especially in um, technology-mediated applications, like extended reality applications. We always involve some sort of technology, and we have some, some level of sensory simulation. But physical presence can also involve a cognitive process to make sense the virtual environment as a physical reality, and that's suggested by Schubert et al. Um, if you think about it, nothing is completely, um, you know, like any perceptual things that you, if you really want to make sense of the environment, you need to use your cognitive effort. You need to sometimes think, and some, especially in, in a VR environment, if the sensory simulation is not perfect, you need to think a little bit or maybe hard to really make sense. And, and, and when you get used to that uh, imperfect sensory simulation, sometimes it actually becomes plausible. Initially, it might not seem plausible, but when you get used to it and then, you know, and, and you kind of deceive yourself, fool yourself that, okay, this is actually what the real world represents. And then I now think it's plausible, but that's basically a cognitive process, isn't it? You know, and, and by your experience and, you know, you kind of create your own expectation through the experience, and and that makes things uh, more plausible. And Brown's, Brown and Kyans, they also consider uh, presence as a as a cognitive thing. So, physical presence is a state of total immersion achieved through engagement, engrossment, you know, task or activity. Uh, and Whitmer and Singer also suggest that uh, presence is a selective attention as well as sensory fidelity uh, determine the level of presence and sheridan uh, suggests that the ability to interact with the virtual environment is very important for physical presence so for example switching on and off a fan in a virtual room you know that you're basically interacting with the environment itself and that's important for feeling uh, physical presence. And that leads to uh, this important concept of sensory motor contingencies. Uh, it's, it's a concept uh, proposed by Oregon and Noy. And uh, this is simply about um, the relationship between our perception and motion. Right? Our sensory perception is always linked with our motion. It's, it's actually uh, enhanced by our motion. For example, you know, in everyday life, we move our head to localize where the sound comes from. Especially, you know, front and back confusion is resolved by just a little bit of head movement. You know, you see where the sound is coming from, front or back. Or sometimes, you know, when you hear something uh, from the ground, uh, you can't really localize exactly where it is. But when you look at, uh, you know, move your head and then look at the object, and you can see where it is. So um, our perception and motion are closely linked. So um, the sensory motor contingencies supported by the immersive system is very important. For example, head head tracking, motion tracking in in three DOF, six DOF VR applications, they're very important to boost the sense of presence and that eventually leads to more immersive experience okay and but on the other hand you know physical presence can occur without any sensory simulation like again reading a novel can also give you a bit of presence um, but that's more related to narrative engagement narrative absorption and narrative transportation concepts which are more cognitive but in the context of xr you know as I said, we always have some sort of sensory simulation offered by technology. So purely narrative-based uh, PP, physical presence, is very unlikely to occur. At least I think. But, of course, narrative of the content can contribute to immersive experience.
because you know when even if you have these wonderful technologies surrounding you, I mean the sensory simulation that you have in VR, if the content has no narrative, <laughs> you know, sometimes you may struggle to really feel like you're there. You know, if the content itself doesn't provide you the narrative. So uh, I'll come to this more later with some practical examples. But the more advanced the immersive system, the more likely it will reduce the cognitive load required for PP. This is what I'm proposing. I'm not saying um, the more advanced the system, the greater the immersive experience is. Okay? So this, th these are different because if you just say that the more immersive the system is, the greater the immersive experience is. That, you know, we go back to this example of using 25 speakers and playing a mono signal, you know, that 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 is a great example for that, I think. But um, if you use more speakers, then we increase the potential to to provide immersive experience to the listeners. But then there are all these this low-level features like the correlation, recording, mixing techniques and all that, you know, reverb and but that's not the scope of our discussion today. Okay, social presence. Um, the degree to which the user feels access to the intelligence, intentions, and sensory impression of others. It's also a definition by Bioka. And yeah, it's basically uh, both perceptual and cognitive uh, concept. The minimum level of social presence is simply when you just sense the presence of other virtual beings. So you see some virtual beings and they look really realistic, that minimum level of social presence. But the higher level of social presence is achieved through interaction with the virtual beings at an intelligent and emotional level. So when you communicate with the virtual beings, and you know, when you express something that the, the, the virtual being responds to you emotionally or intelligibly, intelligently you know that that kind of mutual communication is necessary for higher level of social presence so like a great example is like a virtual conductor you know when you uh, wear the headset and then you see the orchestra in front of you that's a low level of uh, social presence because you see some other beings in front of you but the higher level of uh, social presence will be achieved when you actually interact with the musicians when you actually conduct the orchestra, they respond to you at an emotional and intelligent level. And that is basically achieved through the um, sensory motor contingencies supported by the immersive system, because you need to have a motion tracking device for this, right? And, and you also have to move your head left and right, looking at different musicians and so um, that's social presence and self-presence uh, represents a user's mental model of himself or herself inside the virtual environment. And the uh, uh, physiological and emotional states, uh, sorry, I think I was meant to say psychological, but anyway, so virtual self is experienced as an actual self. That's what self is, uh, self-presence is. So again, this um, conductor, feels like, well, you, you're not really a conductor, but you actually feel like you're becoming a conductor because you're conducting the orchestra. And um, there's also three levels of self-presence. The first level is how realistic the virtual self represent. So when you see your hands, in a, you know, wearing VR headset, you see your hands and your motion. And if it is really realistic, that's basically a good proto-self. But a core self, the next level of uh, self-presence is uh, induced through social interactions with mediated objects, your virtual uh, musicians, but that's necessitating um, social presence. But the, the ultimate level of uh, self-presence ex extends itself through intelligent uh, or an emotional communion with the virtual beings. So this concept is quite linked to its uh, social presence because without social presence you can't really have self-presence I mean that's at least what um, yeah based on right and uh, study um, I think uh, social and self-presence can uh, are actually interrelated so without social presence it's really difficult to have a very high level of self-presence in, in XR involvement very 
quickly. Um, it's also multidimensional. Some researchers provide different dimensions of involvement, uh, like college. Um, Brown and Kyans are introduced their uh, ground theory study. Um, they found that there are three steps of involvement uh, in the process of immersion. Uh, um, yeah, towards the goal of uh, total immersion in gameplay. The first step of involvement is engagement. So this term engagement is sometimes confused with involvement, but engagement to me, and you know, based on their study, is the initial step towards um, involvement. And then the second step is they call engrossment. It was a new term I came across. I quite like that actually because. Yeah, it separates um, engagement and yeah, involvement. So engrossment is the next level of involvement. It, it requires some emotional attachment. So for example, when you're playing games and you're losing the game and then you get really angry and then you get frustrated and you know that level basically represents engrossment. If you're just playing game without emotion, that's just engagement because you're engaged with the game, the 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 equipment and all this, you know the context of the game that's just engagement but engrossment involves emotional attachment and eventually you get this total immersion and but they uh, consider total immersion as the same thing as presence so there is another uh, yeah confusion some people think immersion is not presence immersion is just involvement you know, so there are these conflicts in the literature. So um, I'm just briefly gonna show you, um, tell you something about flow. Uh, maybe you are aware of this concept. It's quite a famous concept in psychology, and yeah. But if you anyone can pronounce this name properly, please help me. But <laughs> anyway, he, he's a he's a really well known um, psychologist um, from Russia and. And uh, his concept of flow is about an optimal experience for happiness. This word optimal and happiness, they are important here. Because optimal experience for happiness requires some conditions. Like you, you need to have some ability to complete the task and you need to have clear goals and you need to get immediate feedback, deep involvement and a sense of control and lots of self-consciousness. And... But it's all about enjoyment, right? And and this concept is sometimes confused with immersive experience. But you know, immersive experience is not necessarily enjoyable. If you think about it, if you play a boxing game in VR and then you got brutally beaten by the opposite uh, virtual player and, and you get really frustrated and you get angry and that's not enjoyable, but you can be fully immersed in that game, right? And I actually have this uh, uh, when I play FIFA football game, you know. <laughs> I play at a low, like a beginner's level and I, I can score 10 goals against Manchester United. <laughs> you know, that's enjoyable, um, you know, because I can, I have the ability to, to win the game and, you know, I have sense of control and all that. But, you know, if I increase the level to like professional or world class level then i can't even score any goal and <laughs> i get beaten by the opponent you know and that's really frustrating i actually you know in that case i keep playing the game to win you know at, at least once and if i fail that i get really frustrated and angry and but that means i was very immersed in the game but i didn't enjoy it because i didn't have the ability to to do it so it's not an optimal experience for happiness at all. So that's why I separate flow from my model. Um, okay, so the proposed model suggests uh, physical presence and involvement influence each other. And yeah, I've got 10 more minutes. I'll try to finish in 10 uh, so we can have some discussion. And involvement is an important factor for presence, as I already uh, explained and strong PP could also develop an intimate relation to the narrative suggested by Ryan and I also think that being a being in a plausible virtual environment leads to 
more realistic motor responses to a sensory simulation you can basically you know behave more naturally more realistically in the ve and this might also foster natural interactions with the virtual objects eventually leading to a higher level of involvement because you know interaction is important for involvement and this interaction can be boosted by a sensory simulation so ppn in these are important for example if you're playing a like a tennis game in a in a vr environment you know all the sensory simulation offered by the system like the reflections the reverberation from the audience and and also the surrounding crowd noise and all this will basically encourage you more and then you probably you get more involved in the game and then you concentrate better and then maybe you feel like you you're there the sensory simulation will provide you the, the sensation of being there but will also boost your involvement in the game okay uh, engagement is a lower level concept to um ppsp and inv okay so there are basically intersections between uh, each of these concepts um this is based on uh, the literature you know uh, several researchers suggest that engagement is just the first step towards a higher level experience like involvement and uh, cognitive absorption so that's why i put engagement in between um, each of these uh, concepts so for for uh, pp and sp physical presence and social self-presence uh, we have the sensory motor engagement so you need to be engaged with um you know the virtual environment in terms of sensory perception and motor perception i mean sorry motor uh yes you have this sensory motor contingencies supported by the system and that's important for physical presence and social presence and involvement and social presence have the intersection of task motor engagement so if you're playing a game then you need to engage with the task and uh, you also need to use your motion and that's also important for social self-presence as i already explained before and narrative engagement is also relevant to physical presence and involvement it's more important for in involvement i would say but it's still relevant to physical presence as well because the narrative of the content can also influence physical presence. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the properties of immersive system. Um, I chose these three words, plausibility, interestingness, and interactivity. So plausibility is a big topic in itself. Um, that's, to me, most important for physical presence and social presence. And interactivity is mainly to do with involvement and social presence, self-presence. And interestingness is important for involvement and physical presence. But they are influenced by subjective factors. So plausibility is mainly influenced by internal reference, your experience and expectation. And interestingness, of course, is a personal thing, uh, your personal preference about the uh, content itself and the barrier for interactivity is um, <clears throat> the skills and knowledge you have so how to play a game you know you need to have the right skill to play a ten tennis game if you don't know the rule <clears throat> you can't really interact properly if you don't know <clears throat> if you don't have the motions motor skills to play a certain game then you can't really interact properly so that's the barrier that's the subjective factor for interactivity um, so plausibility okay um, it's basically a property of immersive system related to PP and SP Slater uh, uses this term plausibility illusion and it defines it um, as the extent to which the system can produce events that directly related to the participant the overall credibility of the scenario being depicted in comparison with expectations and it occurs even though the user knows they are not there 
and not occurring in the real life. You know, when you're wearing a headset, you already know that you are in a physical world, and these things happening in the VR world are not real. But depending on the level of sensory simulation and your involvement, <clears throat> sometimes you you get completely fooled, and you you really feel like you are um, <clears throat> experiencing the real things. That's plausibility. And that is mainly related to your internal reference and your expectation of what is real. So, for example, you know, when we are recording uh, 3D audio, there are different ways of recording things and using perceptually motivated microarrays, psychoacoustics psycho uh, based microarrays. Don't necessarily try to replicate all the acoustic cues like in the real world, you know. That's not the goal of uh, perceptual arrays, but ambisonics or wave field synthesis, they try to replicate the real acoustics as, as accurately as possible physically. But often um, people get more immersed and f feel more like... Uh, better spatial impression and better realism with perceptually motivated microarrays because they somehow manage to provide all the necessary perceptual cues whereas the, the physical uh, methods sometimes fail to provide 100% <laughs> accurate sound field reconstruction and it kind of falls down into this uh, uncanny valley you know we, we use that term in robot uh, <laughs> development but yeah in audio we also have this uncanny valley situations anyway so plausibility is influenced by subjective factors eventually because if you don't have uh, any internal reference developed already then you don't know what is uh, realistic and you don't know which what to expect so plausibility is, is a lot to do with your personal factors. And this is also an interesting concept, social realism and perceptual realism. So it's related to plausibility. So social realism is how likely the virtual environment stimuli would occur in real life. And perceptual realism is how close the implementation of the stimuli is to one's expectation if they existed in real life. Okay, so the best example for that is like animations. <laughs> they have a high social realism because all the things happening in animation could be what can happen in real life. So you can actually think it's realistic and but socially. But perceptual realism might be low because it's animation. It doesn't really look like a real person, you know. Um, so, but if, um, the other opposite example is like in, in sci science fiction films, like Matrix, you remember this scene from Matrix, you know, Neo stops all the bullets, you know, <laughs> and all the bullets dropped. It can never happen in real life, but the film, you know, this computer graphics is so realistic. And it, it actually looks like it can happen if it was uh, existing in real life, you know, it, it, it is so realistic perceptually. Right, so we can think about these two concepts uh, when we discuss plausibility. So plausibility is, is about both system and content. And what kind of content it is also determines plausibility. And interactivity is, is quite straightforward. You know, when you're playing a Nintendo tennis game, you know, you need to interact with the um, your, your opponent or your partner. And you need to use your motor skills. Yeah. So that's important for social presence and involvement. And interestingness, of course, it's a, so, a subjective thing. But yeah, I don't know how, how, how many of you are interested in like wildlife, uh, you know, documentary stuff. Um, yeah, this kind of content may not be interesting to most people maybe, you know, unless you are um, like researchers in working in um, animals and, <laughs> you know, natural habitats of animals and stuff but if you watch this kind of content on tv you may switch the channel right away because you're not interested in the content the narrative is not super exciting but if you uh, watch this kind of content in 360 vr <clears throat> with really advanced uh, sensory simulation you might actually find this is um 
really interesting because you never experience this kind of realistic simulation of animals coming approaching to you and interact with you and all that um <laughs> I mean, this. I, I took this picture from this link, sound wild, soundingwild.com, which is run by um, Axel. Axel Drioli is a, is a great um, <clears throat> spatial audio recordist. And, you know, he, he does a lot of wildlife and soundscape recordings in, in the, uh, yeah, in outdoor environments. And, yeah, from this website, yeah, if you check this out and you'll see some interesting 360 content. And I actually, I find myself really becoming involved in this content while I was watching this because these gorillas, I mean, I didn't even watch it in HMD. It was just uh, on the computer screen, but I became more interested in gorillas, to be honest, because while we watching it, I found this content quite interesting. <laughs> and I became more interested in um, the habitat of gorillas. And, you know, that can happen. So what I'm saying is um, a great, physical presence can also boost the interestingness of the content too. So this is the last thing to talk about. So overall level of immersive, immersive experience. How do we measure overall immersive experience? As I said, the, the assumption here is that immersive experience is quantifiable, measurable. Uh, most of the studies use like rating scales for presence and involvement. So OLIE can be determined by the weighted sum of individual levels of those three components. And the levels of um, yeah, these three concepts would vary substantially for different, different types of content, of course. So for example, if you're watching a 360 4K video of Grand Canyon, you might have very high physical presence if it was presented over HMD. But you have no social presence because there's nobody to interact with. You might have low to mid involvement depending on your preference, your interest. You know, if you are like a mountain climber or, you know, a researcher working on a geography or, you know, earth history or whatever, you know, then you might be quite involved in this kind of content. But other people may not be involved so much. But uh, if you're listening to um, <laughs> uh, an LP of a classical recording, you might have zero to low PP. I mean, the reason I say low is because you can imagine you're being in a concert hall while listening to music, just closing your eyes, just imagine you are there. But you'd have no social presence. and But involvement could be really high if you're a classical music fan. So there might be different levels of um, of these different components and they might contribute to immersive experience in different uh, weightings. For example, I don't know if you ever played this game, StarCraft. It's a highly involving game, <laughs> but the graphics are quite low level, I think. It's complicated. It's <laughs> but people who play this game, they get really immersed into the gameplay, <laughs> you know, regardless of this low level uh, sensory simulation. So PP could be very low, but immersive experience could be very high. So this means that we need to weight the PP component uh, lower than other components like involvement and social presence, depending on the content type. And this is for, for future study. Um, I'm planning uh, in the future some systematic study that will create some statistical model for measuring immersive experience. So I'll uh, finish with this example here. Um, as an example of ultimately high overall level of immersive experience, you need to have all of these components described in this model. So consider a child who is a fan of Disneyland content. He already have has, has experienced all these different uh, Disney content, Disney animation, theme songs. He is so experienced with this. And now he wears this HMD and go into this Disney world virtually. And he sees all these buildings in front of him and all the streets and he hears Disney theme songs and all this. This will in, in instantly give him some level of uh, physical presence. 
because of the sensory simulation. Now he explores the streets and then he sees some building and then hears some sound coming from the building. And now he goes in there and sees all these Disney characters like Mickey Mouse, you know, Minnie Mouse and all these, you know, Disney characters like singing and dancing and, and trying to engage him with, you know, and inviting him into the party basically. And so basically he has high level of social presence because he's got this interaction with the virtual beings. And the sensory motor engagement is important because he needs to be able to walk around and touch the virtual beings and you know he perceives the environment by moving and you know using his motor engagement. And and then he eventually gets really involved in that scene because he's singing together, he's dancing together with the virtual beings and will be highly involving experience and so we have all of these components interactivity plausibility and interestingness supported by the immersive system and the content is very interesting too and he already had internal references because he already a fan of uh, a content and yeah so all of this um requirements are met perfectly in this situation so overall level of immersive experience would be very high in ar situation you know if you have a like a virtual band playing with you you're playing keyboards along with uh, other virtual musicians i mean this is a very low level simulation i would say but if you have like actual musicians appearing in the space in a real space and then you can see them in 360 and you can move around in six off it will be very highly immersive experience as well. But a uh, question might be whether you uh, feel physical presence or not, because you are already in the physical uh, space in AR. You see this physical world still while you're playing with virtual beings. But by the narrative of the content, or maybe through the involvement, you might feel like you are actually on the stage, even if you, you know you are on the on your kitchen floor <laughs> you know so this kind of thing is is for further research really um okay so that's it that's all i need to say and um thank you for staying with me for an hour of this talk and yeah now shall we have some discussions or questions